So uh, today I want to talk about prayer. How many of you like to pray? Okay. How many, how many of you pray have no problem praying at all? Okay. Well, I, I heard of a, uh, a pastor, a, 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 a pastor was talking to somebody, and uh, he said, yeah, do you know what the Lord's Prayer is? He said, of course I know what the Lord's Prayer is. What is it? Now I lay me down to sleep. <laughs> I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I should wake, I pray my Lord my soul might take. And the pastor said, that's great. That's the Lord's Prayer. No, it's not. No, it's not. But uh, praying today is not just, by the way, that's not in Scripture. What is prayer? Prayer is communication. Uh, and let me ask you a question. What relationship do you, are you aware of that can survive without communication? All right. Most of the time in workplaces, if there's not clear communication, conflict begins to happen in the office, right? If there's not clear communication in the operating room, uh, there can be a problem. Hand me a scalpel. Instead, they give you an apple. That's not good, okay? So you want to make sure communication, without communication, no relationship can flourish, and without communication comes disintegration. Without communication, there comes disintegration. We need communication, and prayer is simply that. Prayer is not a cantation. Prayer is not trying to get God to do something. And so a lot of people struggle with prayer for a variety of reasons. Sometimes the people feel ashamed. Well, you don't know what I did in the way to church today. I cursed out my whole family. Everyone that laughed at it. Okay, no, I... <laughs> right? I, I, last night, I, I did this or the other, and you don't know what I did this past. We feel ashamed. Like, I can't go to God. Listen, everybody, don't run from God. Run to God. I feel ashamed. Or how about this one? I feel obligated. And I guess I need to pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for today. You ever do that, everybody? You're sitting there trying to pray and go to sleep, feel obligated. Or how about this one? I don't know what to say. I, I, look, I mean, I've done it before. Now I'll lay me down to sleep. Okay, now what do I pray about God? I don't know what to pray. I don't know what to say. How many of you love going to prayer meetings and they ask you to pray? Isn't it the best? That's like the best, right? And someone, just before they ask you to pray, there's someone that speaks in eloquent King's English. Lord God, we pray today that you would just touch our nation, and Lord God, and that you'd beseech, and you're sitting there. Now it's your time to pray. Help, right? <laughs> so I'm not going to that prayer meeting again because that person, we could publish their prayer, prayers are so awesome. I, I can't, I don't know what to say. So we get contaminated by that. We don't know what to say. Or how about this? I don't think he's listening. Ever feel that way? I felt that way. God, are you even listening to me? I mean, I, I'm just going through the motions here. I'm just praying to the, I'm just praying to the drywall, right? God, where are you? Or, or various other reasons I don't want to bother him. I, why would God care about my parking space? If it's Christmas Eve and you haven't bought your wife a gift yet, God cares about your parking space because he cares about your marriage. Uh, no, seriously, I don't think God cares. God cares about the smallest things. Or how about this? Now, here's another one. I don't trust him. You know, I prayed for my, for my mother to be healed of cancer, and she died. I was abused as a child. I went through this or the other. I don't trust God. Frankly, I don't think it makes a difference what you pray. God is going to do what God's going to do. I don't get an answer, right? So I, I, I'm an existentialist, so, uh, which basically is that's the way the cookie crumbles. Or my favorite cliche, it is what it is. I'm not, that's not my favorite cliche. But, you know, why even bother to pray? God's going to do what God's going to do. It makes no difference at all. And sometimes we can start feeling that way. But what are we to do? Prayer is not what you think it is. Prayer is communication. It's, it's about communication. It's driven by a relationship, not a need or crisis. It's like a, a little boy, a pastor went to a little boy, says, little boy, did you pray today? He says, no, I didn't do anything bad yet. Right? Or how about this? Uh, we do this all the time. Any prayer requests? No, everything's fine. Right? 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 We only pray there's a problem. Why not just pray? Imagine that. Imagine you only talk to your parents when there's a problem. <laughs> How many kids got kids in college? That's exactly what happens, right? Yeah, we only talk to God when there's a problem. No. Relationship with God. You see, what happened in the very beginning of humanity, you were designed by God for communication with God. 
You and I are designed by God for communication. And when it first thing happened in the garden, Adam and Eve, God would walk in the cool of the day and they'd have communication with God. In fact, also what would happen is, very clearly in the book of Genesis, God gave dominion to mankind and Adam would name the animals, which indicates in the Hebrew mindset, from my understanding, a lot of theologians would agree with this, is that he also helped to describe and was part of the creative process. So when Adam is sitting there in the beginning of the day, hippopotamus, platypus. By the end of the day, blackbird, <laughs> bluebird. So, but God is naming all the animals with mankind. There is a communication that we get to, to work with God. We're co-regents. We're co-laborers with God. And this is the way it was. God would speak to us. And there would be a communication long before there were outlaws and in-laws, right? Long before you lost your job, long before we had interesting things going on in Washington, D.C., people would just have a relationship with God and just speak to him and have a good relationship. That's what it's about. So any relationship without communication would disintegrate through a period of time. In fact, maybe that's part of the reason some of you are struggling in your marriages. You're not communicating. And I can find that happens too. Sometimes my wife and I were like two shifts passing in the night. We're like, we're like uh, FedEx and UPS. You know, I'm dropping off packages. The kids are going here. She's going there. In fact, did you hear what happened to UPS and, and FedEx? They, they decided to merge. So I hope you bought stock. They're going to call it Fed Up. <laughs> so, yeah. So sometimes you're just fed up with communication because you just, uh, and communication is so important, right? And it's so difficult to do. So this is so important. In the Leviticus, they would have a temple, and even in the tabernacle, uh, what's a tabernacle? Let me explain. The Israelites came out of slavery, and they were in the wilderness for about 430 years. While they were there, uh, they built a tabernacle. In that tabernacle, it was a picture of what our spiritual life is supposed to be like. Each of the furniture, all the things was a picture, if you will, of what happens in the natural. So anyhow, they had a fire burning. They always had to keep the fire burning. That was their obligation. And my friends, prayer is so important. We need to keep the fire burning in our lives. In fact, they said this, um, that they used to keep the fire burning through relationship. Adam and Eve would do that, right? They kept the fire. So it happened even before that. Now, you ever hear of this? Disruptive denial of service. You know what that is? That's when the, your computer network goes down. Or about, how about IT outage? How many of you remember Y2K? How many of you still have baked beans in your, in your cellar? <laughs> <laughs> don't eat them. They don't taste very good. I tried. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, uh, but, but we, we, have, uh, we have the situation, IT outage. What happens when there's IT outage? Your communications are off, right? Uh, I, I went to Starbucks a, uh, <laughs> several weeks ago. And I went in there, I offered my drink. She says, it's free. I said, why? Are you the manager? No, the computer's down. <laughs> well, don't you know how to add? I can't open it up. I'm not, I don't, by the way, I don't know how to add either. No, it's just take it. So the whole store, the drive through everyone, everyone walked out with thousands of dollars of drinks. Why? Because the network was down. When the network of God and you are down, you're not functioning like you should. You're not able to have the interchange with God and people, and you find yourself disconnected because we are supposed to be connected to the network of heaven. We're supposed to be connected to each other and the mainframe of heaven, God. And when there's no communication, it's devastating. It happens in the natural. What would happen with the banking system if, it was, if there was disruptive denial of service? You can't, you can't buy anything, right? Right? So it's the same way. It's important we had this whole thing together. Now, how many remember this? <laughs> Windows 90. I've been to someone's house, and they had Windows of 95. And I was trying to help them out. And they're like, well, I, I can't run into new programs. I, yeah, that's outdated. I mean, that's... Some of you weren't even born. Who was not even born then? Okay. <laughs> you bunch of youngins. <laughs> Ever hear of DOS? Okay. So anyhow, so a lot of us are running like this. We're, we're running from the 1940s or 50s. We have a relationship with God. Our operating system is so dead. We're living on yesterday's experiences and everything. We're not even connected to God or anyone else. But we love God, but we're not connected anymore. We're running in Windows 95. 
So we don't want to run on Windows 95. And what happens is, when we're not running Windows 95, when we're not connected, what happens? We're missing the mark. I don't know if you've ever seen Charlie Brown, very famous cartoon called Peanuts. It's, I mean, it, it's a good thing he, he wasn't around today. He'd be in psychotherapy, and he'd be admitted to a mental institution. Uh, <laughs> Charlie Brown, he's depressed all the time. But anyhow, and he has no hair. I don't understand that. But that's beside the point. So what he would do, is he would take an arrow, and he would shoot it. And then, and then he'd go, around, go where the arrow was shot, and he'd draw a circle around us. Lucy says, what are you doing? He says, that way, I always hit my target. <laughs> you see, when we're missing the mark, maybe you're missing the mark in your marriage. Maybe you're missing the mark with your body. Maybe you're missing the mark in your spiritual life, and you're like, I just can't seem to hit it. Do you know what that actually means, missing the mark? Do you know what definition of sin in the Greek actually is, harmatia, which is missing the mark. It's a sin not to pray. You're missing the mark. You're out of the sequence. You're not connected to the mainframe, right? There's, there, you have an IT outage. You're living with your own internal hard drive, which is, needs to be defragged, whatever that means, right? You, you're a full to the brim. You have no cloud. You have no storage, and you can't take it. I can't take one more thing. I have no more storage. My kids come to me and say, Dad, can I have your storage? No, you're not having my storage. Can I get in your cloud? No. You know what the Rolling Stones said? Hey, you, get out of my cloud. <laughs> so they were prophetic, apparently. Prophets they didn't know it, okay? So when we choose not to pray, we sin by missing the mark. In fact, in, uh, the very prophet, the last judge or last prophet before the kings came, what he said, Samuel said this. He said, moreover, as for me, far be it from me, that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. you must see, if my, if my hand does not communicate with my head, it's going to be a problem, right? Multiple sclerosis, what happens is the neurons have this, this sheath on it, gets messed up into scar tissue because the body begins to, dis, to, to begin to try to hurt itself for an immune situation. And so now you're trying to tell your hand to move and your brain fires the synapses and it doesn't get here right with the way it should. A lot of us have sclerosis in our relationship with God because we're just not spending time. Now, again, listen, this is not like a legalistic... You're designed by God to be part of the network, the mainframe. You can't be running on 95 DOS or Windows, right? So we have to pray without ceasing. Well, how are you supposed to do that? Prayer is this not prayer. Prayer is a mindset. But I want to share with you about prayer today. If prayer is not real to you, then God's not real to you. I'm telling you the truth. All right, this, again, this is here we go. 101, marriage, right, guys? Or even parenting. If I don't talk to my children, I, our relationship is not really real anymore, right? One of the things I loved about the summer uh, is it, it really showed me the importance of spending more time with my family, which sometimes I don't spend enough time, and I recognize that. You start spending more time, you, you start understanding each other, start laughing at each other. Communication gets a lot better. Why? We're spending time with each other. And so it's so important because your marriage will not be real to you if you're not spending time. You're going to lose that loving feeling, all oh, that loving feeling, and it's gone, it's gone, it's gone, because you're not spending time with your spouse. Well, we're together. No, you're not. I mean, we spend... Nine hours a day in screen time. We touch our phone 2,176 times a day, according to what I read. So we're not even looking at each other's eyes. Mm -hmm. how, about, how many of you do this? You're talking between, how about this? You're talking to your spouse through walls, right? How many of you text in the house? <laughs> Come on. Okay, there's only one honest person here. <laughs> We're talking through walls. There's no eyeball to eyeball, right? I'm sitting there going, mm-hmm. I, I have to be honest. I'm sitting there. I can't believe what's going on now. I'm looking at the Yankees and how they just, just fall apart. And I'm reading about all the, what they're going to do with Aaron Boone. And then the kids are talking to me. I sh quiet, quiet, quiet. I'm going to read this article. <laughs> right? I'm sitting there, uh, uh, sitting there at night, and my wife wants to talk to me, and I'm reading some, some kind of thing. I'm watching a video on something that has nothing to do with anything. Shh, quiet, quiet, quiet. Right? So if prayer's not real to you, then God's not real to you. If you're not second time talking to those people you love, they're not going to be real to you. If you're in a workplace, oh, this is a hard one. 
If you don't talk to your boss or your colleagues, they're not going to be real to you. So it's all part of called communication. You see, prayer, have you heard this one? Prayer does not change God, it changes us. Is that true? No, it's not exactly true. What? Nope. It's partially true. Prayer does not change God, it changes us. What you talking about, Willis? Malachi says, for I'm the Lord, I do not change, right? So why? So God is going to do what God's going to do because God's going to do what God's going to do. It is what it is. God's going to be God, right? No, not, it's actually, it's not exactly true. Prayer doesn't just change you, which is very, very true. It can, but it also changes the hand of God. I don't like that. Well, I, it's in the Bible. So the Lord changed his mind about the terrible disaster he had threatened to bring upon his people. He told Moses, it's almost like in a family vacation trip. I'm going to pull the car over. <laughs> I'm going to take off my belt. Now, that was back in the 70s. and no, we don't do that anymore. We just put in the time out. But God's like, I've had it. Moses, I'm going to destroy these people. And Moses intercedes, God if you have to take my name out of the book, then do it. Listen, guys, I love you. I'll die for you, but I ain't going to go to hell for you. I mean, Moses was willing to be separated from God. The apostle Paul says, Let, he says, I, I wish I could be accursed so you could come to the Lord. I mean, that's how he felt. It's such a love. So the Lord changed his mind. We can see it through Scripture, see it through Amos. He was going to send a plague, and then Amos says, God, please don't do it, and God changed his mind. We see it throughout Scripture in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. So if we don't pray, sometimes things won't happen because God is working with us. If you own a company or you're in the family, if the kids don't do their job, sometimes the bathroom's not cleaned. Sometimes the grass is not cut, right? Because that's their job. We're supposed to work together. Um, and then this is kind of what happens. So the Lord changed his mind. We see it in the scripture. So there's two main wills of God. I want you to understand this. First one is this. God's closed will. He's sovereign will. You can't touch this. Remember, M.C. Hammer, uh, the prophet, M.C. Hammer said, you can't touch this. And you cannot touch this. Dun, da, da, da. You cannot. You cannot touch when Christ comes back. Exactly. You cannot touch what God's going to do at the end of the age. New heavens and new earth is going to happen no matter what you say, no matter what you do. You can't touch this, baby. Okay? That's called God's sovereign, closed will, sovereign will. And then Jesus said, this, said the following. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you can't change it, right? So God is perfect. It does not change his character or his ultimate will. But he does change his timing, and what he'll do at various times. So we have God's closed will, and we have God's open will, prescripted. I call it this, the, the flux. He wants all men and women to be saved. He says, go into all the earth and preach the gospel. So our job is to, do the, to work with the Lord, you see? And if we don't do our job, sometimes things won't happen. God has us part of it. We can actually, the Bible says, you can hasten, you can speed up the Lord's return by doing our job, by spreading the gospel around the world. Now, if you hurry up, we can, leave, we can leave quicker for vacation. If you cut the grass and do the hedges and ugh, paint the barn, okay? Then we'll go on vacation. So there's things that we have to do, and, and so it's part of that. If we pray, sometimes we pray and we don't recognize what's going to happen. A lot of us have unanswered prayer. The Prayer of Jabez, which is a book by Bruce Wilkerson, he wrote a number of years ago. It's a good book. He talked about a, an illustration of Peter going to heaven, and Peter, uh, uh, not Peter, a man went to heaven, and Peter showed him around heaven. And he said, oh, look over here. This is the uh, area over here where they do this and the other. He said, what's over there? Oh, those are warehouses. What's the deal with the warehouses? Oh, you don't want to go there. What's that? Those are warehouses of unanswered prayer. Those are full of unanswered prayer. He says, can I see my warehouse? He said, you don't want to see it. Now, I know that may not be theologically warehouses in heaven, but you have not because you. Book of James. We need to pray. We need to, now, God will never violate his character, but he will his timing. There was a man who was very educated. He was a ladies' man. He was involved with drinking and carousing, and his mother prayed for him for over 20 years. Her name was Monica. She kept praying for this man. 
And one day, when he was in a garden in the Roman area and by Rome, he, he heard a voice say, pick up and read. He opened the Bible and he read the book of Romans and he gave his life to the Lord. And that man wrote the book, Confessions and the City of God, St. Augustine, who is perhaps one of the greatest men in the history of the church who had an impact upon Martin Luther in the 1500s because of what he talked about grace. And, and his, his mother did not stop praying for him. I know another man by the name of Dick Lappert, and he had a, his wife now is home in heaven. She prayed for 17 years for her husband to come to Christ. She kept on knocking on heaven's door. I ain't knocking on heaven's door. Yeah, she kept knocking on heaven's door until finally he gave his life to Christ. And she didn't badger him. She didn't bother him. She didn't nag him. She kept praying and praying and praying and praying. And one time there was an opportunity. Listen, everybody, we do not have because we do not ask not. God has us part of his plan, and the part of it is praying. We have to pray. Uh, it's a mystery to me why God wants to do work with me, but he chooses to. So we need to pray for our children. We need to pray for our country. We need to pray for what's going on in our society. You see, it says in Ezekiel 22.3, I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach or stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not Destroy it. Listen, everybody. America is on thin ice. The nonsense. We, you can see what's happening right now. The, the symptoms of a society completely imploding are happening. We need to pray for our country. We need to pray for ourselves. Number one, that we humble ourselves and we're not arrogant. We need to pray for God to move upon our country, upon the school boards. We need to pray that God would raise up Nehemiahs, would raise up Esthers, raise up Daniels and Josephs to be in the highest positions of government, to be in the presidential's cabinet. We want to pray that God sends people, the Christian men and women, who will be involved in government, who are there, who can make a difference. We want to pray for wisdom to be upon them and that God would not give us over to what we deserve but he would give grace. We should pray for God to send revival. Let's do it right now. Lord, in Jesus' name, Father, our country needs you. And Father, even more than that, we need you. Lord, I'm asking, we're asking together, Father. We're praying for the United States of America that you would bring sanity to our country. Father, that we would fear you and not fear man. Father, that we recognize that one day we're going to have to stand before you. We're asking for wisdom. Lord, we're asking that your church, Lord, starting with me, we, we would turn from our wicked ways. Father, that we would humble ourselves, that we would seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, and that you would hear from heaven, forgive our sin, and you would heal our land. Father, we're asking that you would revive your church and that you would heal America in Jesus' name. Father, forgive us for thinking that human institutions can do it. Lord, we need you, God. Above all, we need you, God. And we are the problem. We're the problem, not them. So, Lord, change us and give us wisdom in Jesus' name. Lord, make us as wise as serpents and gentle as does as we deal with our school systems, as we deal with school boards, as we deal with our teachers as they go back to school. Father, give parents wisdom what to do when they tell the children there's more than one, two genders. Lord, give us wisdom how to navigate that. Instead of blowing up and acting like a fool, we'd be wise, Lord God. we play spiritual chess. Father, that we would have wisdom. Father, in Jesus' name, we declare that you would bring sanity to us. And Father, we pray for the men and women and the children in this room that you'd protect them, Father God. Lord, we declare that this, we're going to see revival in America. We're asking you to send revival in our communities. And Father, that we be strong in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you that greater are you within us than he that's in the world. We thank you. You're the way and you're the truth and you're the life. And we're asking, Father God, that you touch our school systems in Jesus' name. Expose the lies and bring forth the truth in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. That's an example of prayer. We pray the solution, not the problem. If you pray the problem, you make it worse. It's like picking a scab. No. You, if, you, if you have a scab, you, you, you cover it, you put a bandaid on it, you pray the solution. Some, I have some people that pray for me. Please don't pray for me. I mean, it's like, Lord, we know there's no jobs out there. 
And Father, we know that four out of five dentists say it creates cavities. And they go on and on about these things. I'm so depressed. I'm like, please don't pray for me. Okay? Pray the solution. That's a little, little side note. So we need to stand in the gap for our land. Okay? We don't need to get on social media and, and show up with an, an, another outlandish thing that's taking place. What's that going to do? How about this pray, right? That's what we want to pray. I, I, don't think, I don't think I've ever, my mind's ever been changed by social media. It just gets me irritated. Am I the only one? Okay. So, a powerful prayer life with God. How do we do it? We're going we're gonna to spend the rest of our time here today. We're going to do some steps. Why does there have to be steps? Because God is a God of order. All right? The sun rises a certain time. There's seasons. God is a God of order. He's not a God of disorder. And if you want to have a powerful prayer life, you need to have order, and I need to have order. Well, I just do it whenever I want to do it. Well, try doing that with work and see if you can keep a job. I don't have a job. That's probably part of the reason. <laughs> a powerful prayer life with God. How do we do it? Well, prayer must be a priority. And for those of you that are married and those of you that are parents and those of you that are bosses and businesses, you have to communicate with your boss. You have to communicate with your children. And most importantly, you have to communicate with God or it's not going to work. Prayer must be a priority. It is a non-negotiable on your calendar. How many of you would come to, how many would come to work without putting your clothes on? Changing your clothes, excuse me. All right? How many of you, oh, I didn't have time for a shower today. Really? You're going you're to go to, maybe some of you don't. I'm different. Right? I brush my teeth. I brush a couple, a few follicles that are left, right? <laughs> I try to look half decent. I wouldn't just come out and crawl out of bed with some boxers and a shirt I had from college. Right? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to get dressed, right? I'm going to prepare myself. Prayer, I have to make a priority to eat right? I have to make a priority to, to get to work at a certain time. You have to make a non-negotiable priority to pray with God. If you do not make a priority that's a non-negotiable, you won't do it. You may want to do it, but you'll never do it. It's like, oh, I'm going to go to the gym. You'll never go to the gym unless you make it a priority, right? You're never going to pray. I like praying. You might even like praying, but you won't do it because the enemy will come. Someone's going to call you up. Someone's going to invite you to go someplace. You're going to see something on the internet. And the Walmarts, it's singular, not plural. That's for someone out there. There's no Walmarts, there's no internets, and there's no Costcos. It's Costco, it's Walmart. Is that clear? And it isn't what it is. Okay. We're not even going to talk about Target. They're missing the mark. Prayer must be a priority. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. Shut the door to your Father who is in secret. We need to have a place, a priority. Jesus, everything he did, before he did anything big, he prayed first. He went and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. Before he chose his disciples, he went into the mountain and prayed all night. Before he went to the cross, he prayed. Now, he prayed all the time. I pray whenever I want to pray. That's fine. Okay, that, that's fine. I agree we pray all the time. But you need set times of prayer that you can devote to God. You don't just do whatever. It doesn't work that way. So prayer must be a priority. Pray a set time. Why a time? Because if you don't make time, you won't have time. It's like telling you, it's like you're, try going out with somebody and saying, hey, what are you doing on Friday? Let's go out. What time? I don't know. I don't know, just whatever. Where are we going to go? I don't know. Somebody, that's, that's pretty much your dating life. Okay, that's why there's no dates. <clears throat> A little secret for everybody. You might want to pre-plan. Okay, prayer must be a priority. And Sonic is not a good place for a date. Okay. <laughs> that's for somebody out there. Prayer must be a priority. Pray at set times. Do you know in the Bible, the greatest miracles in the Bible happen at certain times? Some of the greatest miracles in the Bible happen at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. How do you know that? It's in the Bible. What do you mean? Well, I'll show you. The greatest miracles. You can see it. Why was that? Because they prayed at 9 a.m. was the morning prayer. 
They would have the 12 o'clock noon as well. And then they had the 3 p.m., which would be the evening prayer. They had to clean up before it got dark outside. So those are the prescribed times of prayer. That's when they would pray. That's when the priest would pray. And incidentally, a lot of great things happen at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. But Elijah prayed, and at 3 p.m., fire fell from heaven. At 3 p.m., Daniel was praying, and an angel gave him information that he needed in the book of Daniel. We can also see in the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, at 9 a.m., the Holy Spirit came. You can see right there, it was only 9 a.m. These people are not drunk as you suppose, because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They had ecstatic experiences. Got, they were speaking in tongues. All kinds of things were happening. And they say, well, you guys are drunk. No, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. And that was, a, that was a huge event in the church. It inaugurated a completely new age. That was the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. At 3 p.m., we can see in the book of Acts, about 3 o'clock one time, um, Cornelius was praying at 3 o'clock. A Gentile was praying at the prescribed time. He had a visitation of an angel. We can also see in Acts 3, chapter 1, at 3 p.m., Peter and John are going to what? Pray at the temple, and they see the man that needs to be healed. Silver and gold have I not, but in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. So at 9 and at 3, we see miracles happening because they're prescribed times of prayer. God honors schedules. But I just flow by the Spirit. Go ahead. Flow by the Spirit and don't pay your bills. Flow by the Spirit and to get up whenever you want to get up. That's Flowing by the Spirit is often a lazy man's excuse. Now, Daniel was also praying three times a day, 9, 12, and 3. Great men and women of God prescribe times, and they have times for God. So prayer must be a priority. Prayer must have set times and a place. You need a place. Here we go again. Where do you want to go on a date? I don't know. Wherever. Now, I know we do that once we're married. <laughs> we do. If you were to treat your spouse like you treat her now, she would have never married you. I'm just saying. What do you want to do? I don't know. Whatever. No, you planned it, right? You rehearse how to open the door. You plan, you call the restaurant. Right? You, you, you set a priority and go out, right? You set a time and you set a place. It's good to have a place to pray. Jesus had his places. He had the Garden of Gethsemane. He used to go to the mountains to pray. I like to go into the basement. We used to have this love seat. It was a couch from Ray Moore and Flanagan we bought in 19, 1898 or something. And it was a ratty thing. It was disgusting. But I loved that little couch. My wife finally got rid of it, and I've been going to hell ever since. No, I'm just kidding. That's not the case. But, in fact, this couch, uh, I went to Haiti, and I, 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 I hiked up a trail, and I went to this orphanage in the middle of nowhere. It was a really bad situation, and they had the same couch I had. So I would sit in that couch, and I would read the Bible. I'd hear the Lord tell me all sorts of cool things when I'd spend time with Have a place of prayer. Maybe sometimes going outside is good for me, right? I like to be left alone. When I use the water closet, I like to be left alone because it's an intimate time, right? I'm exposed before God. I want to speak out loud. That's why I have a hard time praying. If someone's in the building, I can't pray here. But when I come here by myself, I'll, 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 you come and you'll think I'm nuts. I'm, I'm, I'm yelling sometimes. I'm talking to God. I have a, a dialogue with God, and it's just me and God. And there's no one around. It's wonderful. So you need a time, a priority, a set of time, and a place. To find a place. I don't know a place. Find an arm trail, a chair. You know what? Um, uh, Charles Wesley had a mother. She had like 12 kids or something like that. And what she would do, there was no place to go. She took an apron, put it over her head, and she would pray. So if you ever see your mother doing that, you know what's going on. Okay? So before daybreak, the next morning, Jesus got up and went to an isolated wherever he wanted to go. No. Place. All right, so we have a, a must be a priority, has set times, a place of prayer, and a pattern of prayer. What? I just I let the Spirit just, the Spirit just does whatever he wants to do. Well, what happened when the disciples asked Jesus a question? Hey, Jesus, how do you pray? He told them the what prayer? It's not really the Lord's prayer. It's the disciples' prayer. Because if you want to know Jesus' prayer, John chapter 17. But he, he gave them a checklist of things to pray. In fact, you ever see like an airplane take off? Uh, what they do, apparently, hopefully they do this. They're in there, they're doing system checks. Flaps, check. 
Hydraulics, check. GPS is on, check. You know, you check all the, you go through all the check things. You check all the boxes, if you will. Hit all the switches so you know you can take off. You covered all the essential areas. The Lord's Prayer does that. It actually, these six things cover any pastor, any preaching, any teacher you ever hear is going to deal with one of these six things. It's brilliant. That's because Jesus gave us. So here's a system check. And I, I encourage you to, to employ it, not just say the prayer, but to employ it. In fact, I, I remember 9-11? We had the Twin Towers that were hit with the two planes. We had the Pentagon, and there was another plane that was heading to go to the White House. And there was a courageous man, man and people on a plane. They were flying over Pennsylvania at the time. And his name is Beeman. And he said, he says, he says, oh, what we're going to do, we're going to take this, the, the carriage that has all the drinks in it, we're going to, we're going to run for it, we're going to smash the front door of the fuselage and take over the plane. Even though we don't know how to fly, we're going to crash this thing because they're going towards the White House. Guess what they did first? They said the Lord's Prayer together. You could actually hear the recording. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in heaven and earth. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and after he said amen he said let's roll and they took that car they smashed through and they killed those terrorists thank god how could you say that what they were doing is evil and so they brought it down they prayed the lord's prayer now that's okay the lord's prayer is okay to say but it's actually more of a checklist so you start with praise I need to hurry up here. We need to start with praise. Our Father who art in heaven. Start with praise. God, I thank you for being you. God, thank you. You're my Father. And so you start with praise. Then you get priority. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Not about my will. It's your will to be done. Then you pray for provision. Father, give me this day my daily bread. God, I need, <laughs> Lord, I need patience. Don't pray for patience. He'll give you an opportunity to grow it. We ask for provision. Lord, help me with my family. I need, I need your daily word today. I need to hear from you, God, right? We do provision, and then we do pardon. Lord, give us this day our daily bread, and it's connected. So daily bread and daily forgiveness are necessary. Every day, you're going to have to forgive somebody. And so I go through this. I said, Lord God, I forgive. Lord, forgive me like I forgive other people. And all of a sudden, oh, oh. Okay, and that person, oh, he's like, boop, boop, boop. You know, all these, these people's faces come up and say, oh, God, I forgive them, Lord. Oh, I forgive them. So you pardon, and then you pray for power. Lead us not into temptation, Lord, in Jesus' name. I declare that Luke, Hannah, and Matthew will follow you in Jesus' name. I pray, Father God, they would supersede us, Father, in Jesus' name. I declare they're going to have godly spouses in Jesus' name. Father, thank you that you're calling them to do great things. I declare they're going to be rise higher in the relationship with you than I am. Thank you for Cornerstone Church that you're going to help this congregation to know how to pray, that we're going to see towns change and communities change. We're going to see men and women running for school boards and getting on there. We're going to see people going into politics and making a difference. We're going to see people becoming teachers and leaders in Jesus' name. And we thank you. We're going to see signs and wonders take place, not weird signs and wonders, but people will be healed of cancer and mental health issues will be healed because we're going to pray. We're going to believe that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Father, we thank you. We're going to grow us, not so we grow bigger, but we grow bigger people in Jesus' name. Lord, we declare that heaven and hell shall not prevail over your kingdom. And we declare that Cornerstone will be a healthy church in the name of Jesus. And the most famous thing about Cornerstone Church would be that we lift up the name of Jesus. All right? Amen. So that's what you were in Jesus' name. I pray, declare you open his eyes. We start speaking with God's truth. That's powerful, right? And then we end with praise. Thank you, God. So it's like a sandwich, you know? By the way, it doesn't work. They teach us in management that when you're going to tell someone something, start with praise, tell them the problem, and end with praise. And you know, they, they, everyone knows what it is now. It doesn't work anymore. Okay. <laughs> but it works in the Lord's Prayer. Okay. So here we go. Prayer must be a priority. Prayer at set times. Praise for prayer. Pattern of prayer. And pray out loud. Well, what do you mean? Yeah. Uh, how do we know what Jesus prayed? I just pray quietly to myself. No, he prayed out loud. That's why we know John 17, right? 
all the great prayers of the Bible. They prayed out loud. How would you take it down if they didn't pray? There's something about the spoken word. God said, let there be light. When you and I, verb, what we do is we, we have our lungs breathe in and we have our vocal cords vibrate and we speak the truth of God. Not only do we think it, but we speak it. There's power in the spoken word. Especially when you speak the words of God. So speak out loud in Jesus' name. Plus, we'll keep you awake. And if you have to walk around and pray, I like to walk and pray. And now you don't, people don't think you lost your mind anymore because they think you have a Bluetooth on. <laughs> so go ahead and walk around the path. I'll thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Just talk to Jesus. And people go, oh, he's, he's having quite a conversation there. He's yelling at somebody. Anyhow, so just go ahead and pray. It's okay, everybody. Pray out loud. Pray out loud. Speak it. Say it. It's important, everybody. It, it will encourage you. It will help you grow. And then he said, and he said to them, when you pray, say. Thank you. And then... Pray being quiet and listening. I have a friend of mine, love him. Uh, went out to lunch with him, uh, how many years? Uh, six months ago. We were there for two hours. I might have gotten two minutes in. He talked about how God's doing this and this and the other, how, how his ministry is this and the other. I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How are you doing? Fine. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of boring, to, to be honest with you. It's, it's easy. If I don't want to talk, it's, it's great to go out with a guy and let him talk. But that's not really communication, right? Communication is speaking and listening. So sometimes the Bible says, be still. It's kind of hard to be still when this thing comes, zzz, 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 right? I can't believe what Trump did now. Another indictment. You know, I always, there's always something new, right? I can't believe you mentioned his name. I'm just talking about the news, okay? Oh, what, what happened here? Oh, what's going on in North Korea? Oh, my goodness, what's going on here? And we, oh, what happened to Taylor Swift? <laughs> I don't care. Lord, save her, Jesus' name. Be still. Shut the thing off. Put it in airplane mode. Be still and know that I am God. My sheep hear my voice. Now, we don't have time today to talk about how to get yourself still, but it's good to still and chill and hear from the Lord. Sometimes I'll just listen. I'll out in nature, watch a sunset, whatever, sit there by a, a brook and just kind of sit in the backyard and hear the bullfrogs singing obnoxiously <laughs> and just sit there and listen to the crickets and look at the sky and just let God hold me. It sounds kind of weird, but it's, I have God's presence. So, and then journal what, I, what I'm hearing God say. Reading scripture, Lord, Holy Spirit, what are you saying today through this passage of scripture? So we talk out loud and we also are quiet at times. You see, it's both. It's very important to do. So pray and be quiet. That's important. You see, we have the opportunity to shape history with our relationship with God through prayer. I want to encourage you over the next 10 days to do something. Uh, I hear some quotes I'm going to put down as true. It's time to seek the Lord. You laugh. It's a problem. It's, listen, it's a problem for me. I have to be. I'm, you put a pepperoni pizza in front of me, I'm going to eat it, right? And so you put this in front of me. It's hard. It's hard not to read about what, and I'm not even doing bad stuff. I mean, I'm just looking at the Yankees, all right? I, I, I mean, it's just like this. You know, it's so interesting. The, the greatest fear of distraction is in your pocket. The devil's like, this is, this is awesome. He's saying thank you to, to, to Apple. This, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve Jobs. This makes my life easy. This, you know, the, the, the demons are on holiday now. They don't have to worry about it. The, the phone will take care of it. The algorithms will take care of it for us. We don't have to do anything. Now, the demons are getting lazy now, right? All they have to do is you're distracted. You're even putting Bible verses up and seeing how many likes you get. You're sitting there and you know, and just looking at this the whole time, and, and actually, people are getting nearsighted as a result of it. 2,917 times a day, two hours and 25 minutes of social media alone. Let me, let me double dog dare you. How about you do this? How about we get off social media for 10 days? Huh. <laughs> I 
Imagine that. No social media for 10. Here's, a, here's a one I don't like. No YouTube. But how do I fix my sink? <laughs> Seriously, what would happen? We put these blasted things away. I'm, you laugh, but that's kind of what's going on, man. You know, the pandemic set us up real nice for that. And they call them screenagers. And I'm guilty too, everybody. I'm sitting there trying to have devotion. I look up a Greek word, right? And then I see something that happened about how Aaron Boots should get fired. And then I'll read the article and I won't, I'll lose a Greek name, right? So, so I'm, I'm actually getting to the place now. I'm like, you know what? Airplane mode's good, but I'm actually going back to paper. It's like I'm going off the grid, but I need large print. <laughs> My old Bible, like, what does that say? My arms are not long enough. But seriously, everybody, what would happen if you and I would just say, can we just do the next 10 days and see what happens? Because we're being controlled by these things. Micro, people, even the Apple employees don't give it to their kids. They know. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a great tool, no question. But the algorithms and all that, they set it up, man. They know. You're looking, you're looking at a, an umbrella for your backyard. Now everyone's calling you asking you if you want an umbrella. You pull on the side of the road, some guy, some guy goes, honks his horn, opens the window. What do you, you need an umbrella? How do you know that? <laughs> you even get a drink, you even order alcoholic beverage, and they give you an umbrella. I mean, it's, it's scary. So, you know, we, can we just shut it off? Can I dog, do, double dog dare you to do that? How about we do that, everybody, and spend time with the Lord? You know, we want to be able to do these various things. Oops. Now you get to see what happens. I'm going to turn it off again, Sam, but I will not forget to turn it back on again. So next service, you can come up and everyone can applaud you again. <laughs> so let me encourage you, everybody. Set a priority. Set a priority. Set a time. Set a place. Right? Have a pattern. Well, you have a pattern of prayer to the Lord's Prayer. To write. Speak out loud and be quiet. And watch what God will do in your life.